Professor Kim Turnbull James is Professor of Executive Learning at Cranfield School of Management. She is discussing theories of motivation in the workplace. The study of motivation in the workplace has a long pedigree and going back before the Second World War um, there was the famous study that was done at the GEC plant, um, the Hawthorne studies conducted by Elton Mayo and a whole team of people. What they did in the Hawthorne experiments was to take away a group of people who were um, equally as skilled as the rest of the workforce and separate them and then subject them to different things and to see what actually happened to the way they worked. And some of the things that they did you might consider to be highly motivating, so they were showed them lots of interest and attention. Um, some of the things were to do with uh, how they measured their work. Uh, some of the things were to do with rewards or coercions. And what they found, which is really interesting, was that every single change that they made led to a better performance from those people. So in trying to make sense of their studies, what they realised was that they were tapping into what perhaps most of us know anyway, that real human beings come to work, real human beings like to interact with others. And so in that, if you start to give people attention, you interact with them, uh, then in fact that's very motivating for people and indeed their performance does seem to improve as a result. So it wasn't specific things like the shift patterns or the length of time that they had breaks and so on, it was actually the interaction with people that was the crucial factor. Then we might see some other uh, studies which are very well known. We see, for example, Abraham Maslow's uh, famous hierarchy of needs. What we observe is that at the bottom of his hierarchy, he said, actually, if you are cold, tired, hungry, nowhere to live, your life is miserable, then fixing those things is going to be the most important thing for you. So if we translate that into the working environment, then of course people know, need to know that they can pay, their, their, their wages will be paid at the end of the week, that they can pay their way and foot their bills, that they're not working in conditions that are degradating or cold, miserable. But of course, once you've satisfied those, then people have other needs that come to the fore. So again, their social needs, how do people interact with them? Uh, are they treated as a member of a team? Uh, do people accept them? Are they liked in the workplace? And that leads us on to another level of importance, which is, do people feel that there is any esteem for them? Do they have self-esteem? Do they think that what they're doing is of value? Do they value themselves? And at the very top of his hierarchy of needs is something he calls self actualization which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically it means people want to become all they possibly could become. And in the workplace where they can do it through their work, then that's highly rewarding and highly motivating. Hertzberg came along and said, actually, let's just take this one stage further in the workplace and divided things that he called the motivating factors into hygiene and motivators. And the hygiene factors are all those things that mean we won't leave a job. So we won't leave a job if the pay is good necessarily, we won't leave a job if the conditions are fine, um, we won't leave a job if the work is something that we um, can get on and do and we have sufficient instructions. So there's lots of things that just keep us in the workplace. But if you want to really get people to go the extra mile, he argues that it's more than this, those conditions, it's actually about whether people intrinsically enjoy the work, whether they get recognised for what they do, and those are the motivating factors. I think what's important about all of these theories is that they can provide us with some guidelines and some insights about what people find important in motivating others. What they do not do is provide a set of formula um, ways of doing things in a mechanistic way. And if managers try to apply any model, any theory in a mechanistic way, then that's hugely problematic. What people want is a genuine relationship with their manager and managers need to step back sometimes from being very task focused just to ask the question, what do people need? What am I doing that motivates them? Am I appreciating what they do? Do I value what they do? Do I know them individually well enough to know what's important to each of these people? How does this team work and does it feel like a good place to work? 
how is what they're doing connected to the rewards that we want to offer people in the organisation? And that's not a formula. That's Those are genuine questions and curiosity that a manager needs to have about the best way to work with his or her staff. So none of these should be treated as techniques. They're all insights for the busy manager, not techniques to be used indiscriminately.